right, friends, we're going to get started here in just a moment. Our live stream uh, is getting ready to begin, and, uh, and, uh, and we have people gathering with us online right now. Uh, and in just a second, uh, we're going we're gonna to get started. But we are so glad uh, that you are here with us today for this, uh, for this important conversation as we continue in the season of Eastertide. Uh, I've said this uh, many times before, and we practice it as a church, that uh, the concept of resurrection is far too big and important of a context for us just to celebrate it on one day, right? And so, in the wisdom of our tradition, we spend 50 days uh, celebrating uh, resu resurrection. And so, uh, it is, uh, it's important uh, that we continue to invite people in who can help us think about the, uh, both the practicalness and the expansiveness of what it means to be uh, resurrected people people who live uh, the story of, uh, of the gospel in that kind of a way. Uh, today, uh, for this conversation, I am uh, very excited to have a conversation with my friend and colleague, the Reverend Dr. Paul Wallace. Uh, Paul, welcome. We're glad that you are here. Thank you. Um, Paul is a... Yeah, we can give him a hand. Let's go. We'll start that way. Always good to start with the applause. There you go. Right? Yeah, right? yeah take um, it while I, while I can get it. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, Paul is a, a teacher, pastor, scientist, writer, and speaker. He currently teaches physics and astronomy at Agnes Scott College in Decatur, Georgia, and recently served as a pastor for adult education at the First Baptist Church in Decatur. Uh, Paul writes and speaks at the intersection of faith and science, and while this topic often gets boggled down in conflict and jargon and high-mindedness, I think is a way that we can talk about it. Isn't that yeah. kind of high-mindedness? Woolly-headedness. Uh, you, huh? Woolly-headedness. Woolly-headedness, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Paul loves and does a great job both with wit and uh, with great uh, depth of insight. Uh, to make it practical uh, for us non-science, uh, non-physics kind of people, right? So, Paul, thank you, and we're glad that you're here. Uh, the good news for everybody in the room is that Paul was not born an astrophysicist, correct, Paul? That's that correct. Right, right. okay. <laughs> you were not— <laughs> A baby like all the rest of them. <laughs> Just a baby like all the rest of us. Uh, tell us a little bit about growing up and a little bit about um, your faith— community. You, I know you, you, you're a self-proclaimed science nerd from a very early age. Say a little bit about uh, how science growing up for you uh, became a part of your faith journey. Well, my, it kind of starts with my dad, who was a professor of uh, engineering at Georgia Tech, and um, we had a lot of science books around the house. You know, we had, um, like Carl Sagan's Cosmos came out when I was 12, that was probably the thing I could point to that really opened my, my eyes up. Um, I got to, uh, I came face to face through all these books laying around the house. Uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos, and also, I don't know if any of you remember this, but uh, there was a, time, a series of Time Life books on science that was put out at the time, and one of them was on natural history, you know, and uh, I came face to face with this geologic timeline uh, that I, it, it astounded me. It completely floored me. Um, I didn't, I knew that there had been dinosaurs before people. That's all I had really known. But I had never really appreciated the vast gulf of time that existed between them and us and the even more incomprehensible amount of time that had, had come to pass before the dinosaurs ever showed up. And this timeline was really a thing of great elegance, and it really sucked me in, and it also uh, kind of scared me. Mm. It really, you know, I was only like 10 when I, when I came across this, and um, it really put, uh, and now I, have the, now I have the term, you know, existential angst to put on it. At the time I was 10, of course, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But that really opened me up to the possibility of just the limitless size of the universe and the, and the depths of time. Mm -hmm. But my dad was also like Mr. Church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, every time the church doors opened, we were at church. I was one of the, you know, total church nerds. And I loved church. I loved it. And, uh, and at church, they gave me a different book, right? 
which had a different timeline in it. Uh-huh. And I was like, and I read it, you know. Uh-huh. There's no dinosaurs in here, you know. <laughs> I checked the natural history book. There's no Adam and Eve in here. Mm-hmm. I looked for them, you know, right there on the timeline. I looked in the index for them. Nope. <laughs> Adam and Eve, not there. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's how it started. Um, but I never really, you know, when I, when I read Carl Sagan's book, uh-huh. I totally believed it. Uh-huh. There was, I had, I, something about it resonated with something deep in me, and I uh-huh. totally believed it, and it really scared me, uh-huh. and kind of thrilled me too. So it sounds to me like the context uh, in which you grew up was a context within which uh, this sort of juxtaposition or the, the sort of non-allied enemies of science and faith were actually comfortably in the room together. Right. And the family in which you grew up and the church in which you grew up sort of uh, didn't, didn't sort of naysay the fact that these realities might exist together. Right, but, right. But created a context within which you could be curious. Right. They never really, dad was never really interested, interested in the topic science and religion. Uh-huh. But he made it open. He made it clear that both of these things were real. Both of these things were deeply important. Uh-huh. And yeah, and gave me space to explore it without any fear of, mm-hmm. you know, being mm-hmm. wrong mm-hmm. or whatever. Now, you first got your PhD in physics, physics correct? Right. In physics, right? And, right. Uh, and you and I uh, met when we were uh, both pursuing uh, ongoing theological education at the Candler right. School of Theology in Emory. We were right? the same year. We were, yep. we were. And so uh, the fascinating thing about that is that you had this sort of already established career. I found out today, for those of you that didn't know, Paul taught for a brief time at Hampton Sydney College. So for any of you Hampton Sydney College people there, we just discovered this. He and Chip had a good laugh in, yeah. the, uh, in the corridor. Um, that's, so you had this already established career in science, and yet... Even as an adult and successfully doing what you were doing, you were still curious. I was still curious. And it was not that the questions had not been answered. And so you, you say a little bit about this journey into doing master's work in, in theology as an, as an already professor of. Yes, I, I taught at a college, a Berry College, which is a college in uh, Rome, Georgia. I taught there for 10 years. And I was, you know, I, I went through college and I had these great phenomenal teachers, and I decided, hey, that looks look like a good job, being a professor at a small college, because it's kind of a real job, but you can also be kind of, you know, weird, <laughs> right? <laughs> Am I right? I mean, really, both things happen at the same time, so I thought that's something I could do, and um, so I went, I jumped through all the flaming, across, you know, through all the flaming hoops, and I got my PhD, then I got the job at, the, at a college, and I got tenured, and, and you can look at it one way as just, you know, just a spectacular midlife crisis. <laughs> um, but also, I did feel very much, I remember sitting in my office one day and looking at my, my book, bookshelf, and it was, you know, physics and astronomy and a little bit, of, little bit of religion stuff over here. And over time, it became clear that I could not stay where I was. I simply could not stay. Mm-hmm. I could not do it. And, um, and it, the stars lined up for the family. The kids were young enough. Elizabeth was that a pun? Was that pun intended? The stars uh, lined up? I just uh, talk that way. Okay. Yeah, there you yeah. <laughs> and so it worked out for the family. Uh, but I did feel very much like there was a piece missing. Uh-huh. Put it that way. Yeah. 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 And so that piece missing led you into that context of, of pursuing master's work yes, in theology. Yes, uh, at Candler. And was it... Um, was it a, a question that you were trying to answer? What was it a uh, was there was there was there mystery missing? What what was it that led you to say like theology? I mean, there's a whole other realm of places. I had always go, messed with the idea, and I had been part of several churches. And the one in Farmville at Hamden, Sydney, Virginia, actually, a woman looked at me and said, "You know, Paul, you should you should go to seminary." You know, whether she should have said that or not, I don't know, but, <laughs> but it stuck with me, uh-huh. and, just, and, my, and my wife, Elizabeth, you know, was open to it, um, but I, it just, the science itself wasn't sufficient, mm. put it that way for me. Yeah. It just wasn't. It yeah. just didn't. It, it, I think you, you mentioned a, an unanswered 
question, and I think that's an accurate description of it. I'm not sure what the question was yeah. exactly, yeah. but I felt a real, real deep yeah. drive and an itch. Yeah. To it's amazing that how direction. that happens in all of our journeys, isn't it? That we can, um, that someone's throwaway comment in the midst of our day about a deep question that we have in our hearts or in our lives or about a challenge that we're facing can resonate so deep that it can utterly unsettle us mm -hmm. and lead us into a whole new world. And it just dug deeper. It, it wouldn't, wouldn't, let, yeah. wouldn't let me go. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things that as, uh, that's, you know, as we, could, we could get as lofty or woolly-headed about this conversation as we wanted to. But at the end of the day, uh, it's that sort of intimate uh, awareness of God's presence with us in this vast, in the words of the prayer book, vast expanse of interstellar space that is really at the heart of what we're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It is that we and God and cosmos are on a journey together, and it can be as many fathomless sort of light years. Oh, how close is the nearest star? I always four light years. Four, four, point, four, four point two. 4.2 light years away. Okay, great. Uh, so it can be as far an expansive as the nearest star, 4.2, how many? Like 4.2 light years. Light years away. Uh, or as intimate as a person making a comment to us at church that utterly can change and, embrace and open us up to the mystery of God in our lives. Now, um, one of the things that has blown my mind and you and I talked about this at dinner last night, that has blown my mind is, uh, as it relates to this, is the Skyview app, okay? Oh, yeah. The Skyview app. How many of you know what the Skyview app is? Okay, some of you, I see you. If you have not downloaded the Skyview app onto your phone yet, I strongly encourage you. I did not get the, the production team back there. It's free, to, right? It's free. You can do the paid version. I've never really done the paid version. Um, but, uh, but the Skyview app allows you, as it says, to explore the universe. And you take your phone out, and you move it around. And I'm not just looking at you all right now, but it allows you to kind of like uh, to, to, to look around and see what various things are all around you. And the thing that blew my mind the most about it, and this is, I want to talk about your book, The Stars Beneath Us, right? Finding God in the Evolving uh, Cosmos, is that um, the Skyview app allows you to recognize that uh, there are stars beneath us, right? No, I right, mean, it's, and, right. And that, and that oftentimes we find ourselves walking around on sort of earth in our day-to-day -day bumping around lives with each other, but when you take it out and you kind of begin to look, and I do encourage you to do this from time to time, I'm looking at all the stars around us and the ones beneath us, and the Hubble Space Telescope is right down there somewhere yeah. um, right now as we speak. Um, it's fat, it opens us up, right, right to right. this sort of uh, sense of mystery and to the relationship. Say a little bit about how um, in your book, The Stars Beneath Us, and how this sort of sense of, of, of faith and science and cosmos working together can, can help us understand God and can help us understand uh, faith in our everyday lives. Well, the, the universe is uh, often overlooked by Christians. Uh, truly, uh, it is, you know, we think very much about the human world and, um, you know, the dynamics within our own congregations, within, you know, our cities, our world, and so forth and so on. But um, I don't really want, I mean, I, I do actually want to go into space. I would go. If, if I didn't have a family, I would go. But I wouldn't want to go into just like low Earth orbit. I would like to go to the moon or out that far. It's dangerous out there. I don't know if you know that about space, but you really don't <laughs> want to be out there. Okay? It's not just emptiness. It's really hostile. But I would do it for one reason. So I could turn around and see the Earth suspended in space so small that I could like cover it with my thumb. Mm. Because that's real. That is a real perspective, and it is true all the time. Yet most people, frankly, prefer to not think about it. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it it's, it's unsettling. Mm -hmm. It's unsettling in the way that it was unsettling when Copernicus started talking about the Earth in motion. Mm -hmm. 
people felt like it falling, is the world, everything's falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, and it really does put a new perspective on it, but we need to see ourselves as part of, and part of this enormous and beautiful, mm -hmm. important word for me, beautiful universe that we live in. Mm -hmm. And I do think that there are all kinds of theological implications of that perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, mostly uh, many things, but along the lines, mostly along the lines of we have got to take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have got to take care of our planet. This is a gift. You see it as a gift. You see our lives and our planet mm -hmm. as a true gift because underneath our magnetic fields and underneath our atmosphere, we have such a warm, cozy, beautiful <laughs> place to live, and it is such an exception. Mm. I mean, the, st the, the, the degree to which it is an exception is, is, can't be expressed. It mm. is, we have a lovely place here, and we must take care of it and uh, of each other. And we have to appreciate his gift. I mean, it's that's a total that, gift. That's something that you just said right there that I think yeah. is really important, yeah, right? It's a gift. Uh, we know that. A lot of it, you know that to be true in so many different ways. You hear it. It can almost sound trite that, uh, that all of life is gift. Um, that the opportunity that we are gathered here today having this conversation and participating in it in the ways that we are is gift and grace. Um, but to think about it from that vast sort of cosmic uh, perspective sort of accentuates it um, even, just, uh, even just a little bit more. Um, you make a comment that uh, science doesn't disprove faith. It can actually deepen it. Give, me, uh, give some examples of how uh, science has deepened your faith as you've uh, as you've leaned into to science more deeply, and even as you've done uh, work in the in the church in various uh, different settings with both holding this sort of space for uh, for for science and theology together. Yeah, I do believe that science uh, and people often spend a lot of time trying to uh, you know make science and religion fit. You know, make them comp you know find some way that they can be made consistent with each other, some sort of mental puzzle that's to be figured out. And I do agree there's some of that to it, but my own experience is that science is not in any sense opposed to faith. And if there is friction, and there is friction, mm. it is a creative friction. It is not a uh, just dead, sort of fruitless mm -hmm. friction. Um, that it's a, it, that it's a, uh, the boundaries between the two are where the good things happen, and there's a lot of creativity that happens at that boundary. But beyond that, I, I, I really think of science in my life has actually been not just consistent with faith, but it's been an entryway into it. Mm -hmm. There's this quote from uh, C.S. Lewis that, that might help uh, oh, yeah, with, I think we have, with this. We have it up um, here. it comes from his book called um, Miracles, and it uh, says this. It says, uh, Lewis wrote, it is a profound mistake to imagine that Christianity ever intended to dissipate the bewilderment and even the terror, the sense of our own nothingness, which come upon us when we think about the nature of things. Many a man brought up in the glib profession of some shallow form of Christianity who comes through reading astronomy to realize for the first time how majestically indifferent most reality is to man and who perhaps abandons his religion on that account may at that moment be having his first genuinely religious experience. Mm -hmm. This is important to me, not because I think I was brought up in a glib profession of shallow Christianity, mm -hmm. and because I, I never truly rejected my faith. I questioned it, but I never th really rejected it. it. It is important to me because it gives me comfort hearing someone like C.S. Lewis tell me that that kind of response is a religious response and orients me towards God. Mm -hmm. That fear that I had when I was 10 years old of the universe, of my smallness, I never really got into why I was frightened by that geologic timeline, but it just made me feel like a ghost, like I was nothing. Mm -hmm. Like I was just instantaneously here and then gone. I mean, it's all in the Bible, right? This is stuff is not new. I mean, the idea that we are like, our lives come and go like a sigh, you know, from the Psalms. 
but when you're 10, it's a new idea. And, and, and what I can do now is look back at that mm-hmm. and realize that that was a religious experience and it oriented me towards God. Mm-hmm. And that's what science does. Mm-hmm. That's what, not just seeing the big picture, right? Not just seeing you know, time and space on the grandest scale, but also the doing of science and the making of small discoveries. Mm-hmm. Some of the best moments in my life came when I made tiny little discoveries, part of nature, nobody ever noticed before. I wrote it down in a paper, and nobody ever wrote it, read it, okay? <laughs> it didn't matter. It didn't matter because I had found a little piece of the universe that was nobody had ever noticed before, mm-hmm. either on the nuclear scale or on the cosmic scale. Mm-hmm. And that, 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 is a, that to me is an act of worship mm-hmm. without any qualifications. Mm-hmm. With, without any, any qualifications. That is a true and pure, as, as true a pure and act of worship as anything I've ever done or said or prayed in a church. Mm-hmm. Because it's you uh, living into your vocation. Right. That's and right. you and God and community with all those who came before you who led up to the opening for you to be able to make the discoveries that you made. Right. And then all of those who will come after you who do read the papers, right? <laughs> whether, whether you that, I got one one that I have one that people actually read. Okay, great. There you go. That, that, but, but I think it, it, it goes to show that, again, on the smallest, most intimate level of our lives, finding and grappling with our vocations is critical to the, evol- to, to the evolution of understanding, but also to our own sort of intimate understanding of how God is alive for us and how God finds joy in our worship mm-hmm. of God, both as individuals and as those who we're all connected together. Right. Right. Uh, all discoveries are discover. No discoveries happen in a vacuum. Am I, is that a false no. statement? No. Okay. So I mean, no, yes. Yes. That no. It is. It is a true statement. It is a true statement. Thank you. Uh, so no discoveries happen in a vacuum. Things are uh, are discovered because of that which came before. And in our lives, uh, we live this all the time. We we did, we were not born astrophysicists or bankers or lawyers or otherwise, but we came to those vocations in our journey by virtue of our faith-filled relationships with one another and um, by God's interaction in our lives in, in real time. Uh, the psalmist says, uh, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies above proclaim God's handiwork. Uh, say a little bit about... Um, about beauty oh, and goodness. about the way in which uh, the universe and the beauty within the universe reflect God. And I, I'm sure many of you have seen these pictures that have started coming back recently from the new uh, telescope. Web, yeah. yeah, from the Webb telescope that's going to the outermost edges and sort of, and maybe it's not the outermost edges, but capturing these images which we're able to say. Say a little bit about beauty. And oh, goodness, about, I could, that's, I really think that beauty is a, is, 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 is a divine um, a, a divine phenomenon in, in the world. And it is everywhere. Mm. It is everywhere. And that, that, that sounds like a cliche, and I get that. But um, if you look for it, if you open your eyes, I, I really believe you'll find it. And this is true, not just, you know, looking up at the sky, which is the... Did it have to be so beautiful? Did it? No. I, I don't know. I don't know if it did or not. I don't know if it did or not. But, but there is not one face of nature that is not beautiful. And by beautiful, I don't mean pretty. Mm-hmm. I don't mean pretty. Uh, pretty is not a strong word. Beautiful is a strong word. Uh, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, the world is... And I'm stumbling over my words because I, I really don't know how to, how to say this. But I will try this way. Everywhere I've looked, I've found it. Everywhere I've looked, I've found it. Mm. We've all experienced it. It's not, I'm talking about, not talking about something that's not completely universal. Um, it's as simple as, have you ever really looked at a bird? I mean, I'm not talking about some exotic thing you find in Ecuador. I'm talking about the, the cardinal or the robin 
that's right outside your window. And have you ever really looked at it? Have you ever really noticed it? Um, have you ever really noticed its eye or the way its tail feathers are folded or the way its talons are, it, 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 its, its feet are curved? That's one thing. But beauty runs through, throughout the, all scales of the universe, not just the large, not just you know, the medium size like the bird, but also as you go down deep into matter. You've probably heard of the science of quantum mechanics, and I can tell you it is not what we expected. <laughs> quantum mechanics is not what we expected, but it is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Atoms, nuclei, subnuclear particles. There is an astonishing quality to the world that is, it is completely run through with it. And I have been unable to satisfactorily separate or to make a distinction in my mind between beauty and God. Mm. Mm. I, just, I just can't do it. All right, so just for the sake of people who showed up and were really excited about you talking about physics this morning. Yeah. Okay. Because um, I know that people are here and they're like, I want to hear the physics. You're talking about beauty. You're talking about... So give me an example. I know you love the, the challenge of ta explaining something in a way that yeah. everybody can sort of understand. Uh, talk about the way in which that beauty is manifest to us all the time in the invisible. In the invisible. Yeah, in, in the space between us, in the particles that go unseen. Oh, you're talking yeah. about physics. Mm, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Can you give me a can you give us a brief example of this? I it's can, okay if people's minds no, get blown I, just I'm not going to because my next question is going to be really lighthearted as well. So I'm I'm not really going to get technical here, but <laughs> um I've always had a fondness for Albert Einstein. Mm. As a physicist, of course, I do. Mhm. Mm but I've had the opportunity this semester, we're just wrapping up our semester, to teach rel general relativity for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, this um, subject, may, you know, you, you see an object fall, you see an apple fall out of a tree, right? And you think, oh, there's an apple falling out of a tree. Simple. Well, it's not as, it's not as simple all that, as, as all that. Uh, general relativity basically gives you essentially a glimpse at the matrix, right? <laughs> That's basically what's happening. And you can see that what's actually happening when this apple falls is that the apple is, um, it's not falling. <laughs> and that's not helpful. And I don't mean to mystify things that don't need to be over Everybody's mystified. like, wait a minute, what just happened? But what, but what I'm saying is that, is that talking about beauty, the beauty of Einstein's theory will, it has blown my hair back. I've never had to teach it before, but you never learn a thing, of course, until you teach it. And I'm not even sure how well I've learned it this time, teaching it. But um, the beauty of that theory of gravitation, mm -hmm. which is something we all take for granted, of course the apple falls. Why? <laughs> and why, when you drop an apple, does it fall at the same rate a car would fall? If you took an apple and a two-ton automobile and dropped them at the same time, they both fall at the same rate. Why? Mm -hmm. Sounds like a simple question, but when you it's one of these simple questions, <laughs> you start digging into it, it gets lovely. Uh -huh. It gets really lovely. <laughs> And it does deepen, it, science does deepen yeah. faith because yeah. it just unveils another layer of what creation is, uh -huh. of what God's creation is. Uh -huh. And it just, you know, it just gives you another glimpse into what's going on around you. Yeah. yeah. So people, um, we tend to think as children of the Enlightenment that uh, the more facts we know, the closer we can get into our, the more our brains can get packed with, like, knowledge. Right. Like, the more enlightened or evolved as a species or as people of faith we can be. And the church yeah. fell in love with this idea. Yeah. The oh, church yeah. fell in love with this idea. Just like Maybe everybody even else more did. Than, just like everybody else did, right? Uh, people often forget that the evolution of the Bible in, in print text evolved uh, as, a, as a document at the exact same time in mass production as the dictionary, 
right? And so this sort of construct that the Bible is produced as a book with a beginning and an end and as a source of knowledge that you close together and everything in it is a particular thing evolved at the same rate as sort of the dictionary, right? The first dictionaries and the first Bibles were mass produced within a similar sort of time frame of each other. And so together these technologies sort of uh, open themselves, uh, evolve together and the church is thinking on how uh, if we can just memorize it all, or if we can just know it all, or if we can just take it all in. Listening to you talk, I'm struck by how foolish of a, uh, if knowledge is the absolute end, yeah. that sort of end yeah. never can actually be. Yeah, there's, I, I teach pre-medical students. I'm sure there's probably some doctors in the room. But they really like memorizing stuff. <laughs> Pre-meds just want to memorize things because that's what they're used to in their biology and anatomy classes and so forth. And I, I tell them there's virtually nothing to memorize in physics. I give them all the formulas. <laughs> that's not the point. The point is I'm memorizing the formulas. And it really frustrates them because they have this idea that they've got to just memorize things and sort of fill up their shelves of knowledge in their brains and so they'll be ready to go. Whereas physics is about understanding maybe four or five things really well mm -hmm. at a deeper conceptual level. Once you get those, it's like everything else kind of flows from it. Mm -hmm. and, but even that's knowledge. Even that's knowledge. And I, I don't want this to come across the wrong way, <clears throat> but one thing that students are not comfortable with and that people in general are not comfortable with, and I, uh, on, on many days, am not comfortable with, is the idea that we as a species, human beings, really don't know that much. <laughs> we, uh, the, the, the mm -hmm. ocean of things we don't know mm -hmm. <laughs> is vast. <laughs> um, that's, that's my starting point. And I'm not talking about me or Albert Einstein. I'm talking about humanity. Mm. What we know, yes, we can write, chat, we can invent an AI that can produce, you know, kind of a bland, um, you know, five paragraph essay. And that's only going to get better. You know, we, do, we can do all kinds of things. We can build some pretty fast computers. We can go to the moon. We can go to, eventually go to Mars. But I really believe that. The starting point of all understanding is knowing that we are infants mm. when it comes to understanding. Mm. And um, you have to respect what I believe is a vast ocean of unknown things. Mm. And maybe not even things that we can know. And, I mean, why, why should it even be that we should be able to know everything? Why, why is it that, you know, it wasn't until mathematics came, or, you know, they started applying mathematics to physics that it really started to work. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until, you know, Galileo, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, they started using math, and all of a sudden, these are phenomenon in the universe kind of tumbled together in this nice kind of tight way. Who's to say there's not another sort of step like that beyond math that would open up a whole new mm -hmm. oceans of understanding? Um, I just, I just believe in our fundamental ignorance, <laughs> and it's a, and it's a, and, and it, and it keep, and, and on my best days, which are, you know, maybe one out of ten, <laughs> you know, it, it keeps you humble, keeps me humble, yeah. and that's that's that is really the starting point. Yeah, it's whether it's a religious yeah. knowledge or scientific right. knowledge, humility, right. yeah. and sort of knowing before whom you stand. Yeah, it's a different. It's a different posture to live with, though, right? Oh, it is. It's a totally different humility, uh, particularly religious humility, and humility about what we can understand about God is a totally uh, different starting point than certainty or than, uh, than sort of uh, uh, than uh, arrogance around what it is that I think I know. For like yes. maybe certainty wasn't the right word there, but yeah. but, uh, but arrogance around what yeah. I think I know. But that's where I think the beautiful thing is that um, 
is that we, if we can embrace that with the right prayer posture and we can sort of allow ourselves to, uh, to know that, uh, that, that God is not done working, that God is not done revealing God's self to us, I think this is another thing that we often sort of take for granted because the Bible is a book. Um, again, I go back to this sort of yep. technological thing that the Bible is a book. And so we think, uh, what, what's the old saying? Uh, God said it, some people wrote it, they printed it, that's it, right? Or how, whatever, <laughs> whatever the, the phrase is. Because it's a book, we can almost treat our faith like, if only I can get all this stuff downloaded and I can understand it perfectly, and maybe I need to take Greek or Hebrew, or I need to think like a first century Palestinian, or I need to, that, that if only I can get that key just right, then my faith is all going to make sense in the world. Or I'm going to be able to make sense of all the manner of things that happen right. in my life. Right. And in truth, what I'm, what I'm hearing you sort of invite us to think about is like, that has never been true. That has never right? been true. That has never been true. And we are constantly learning about how, uh, about the nature of God. We are constantly learning about the nature of our relationships with each other. And, uh, and we are constantly uh, discovering together in our lives about what faith in the world can look mm -hmm. like. So, a most important question, not certainly not the last, but another of the most important questions, uh, is there life on other planets? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, that's a question I actually get asked pretty often. I mean, a lot of NASA's current work, a lot of astronomy's current work is in the realm of uh, uh, astrobiology. And maybe you've not heard those two words put together before, but astrobiology. It's a big deal, and it's a really good question. Is there life out there? Now, my, my, my own, you know, it's, believe me, the questions that need to be answered in order to get to an answer to that question are many. <laughs> it's, it is not a simple, there are so many parts to that. But my bottom line is this. My view is that there is certainly some kind of life out there. And right now, I'm confining ourselves to our galaxy. Just our own little 100,000 light year across galaxy, our own Milky Way, which, by the way, is a lovely galaxy. We, have a, we live in a good neighborhood. <laughs> um, but within that galaxy, I'm certain that there is some kind of life. But I'm equally as certain that it's probably only something like bacteria. Mm-hmm. As far as communicable life, which is really the key here, mm -hmm. life that we could communicate with, mm -hmm. not even in, not even like I mean you know, you know my house cat right. If there's a if there's a planet of house cats somewhere, <laughs> uh, we'll never know. Uh, right. Okay, because they're never going to communicate with us. <laughs> um, but as far as communicable civilizations go, I think in our galaxy, among the 200 billion or so stars in our galaxy, I would say probably not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The list of things that has to go right <laughs> in order for, he, for us to be here, it is a super impressive list. Uh -huh. And I'm not going to bore you, but I could come up with, off the top of my head, at least 12 to 15 things, and I'm sure the list is longer than that. Probably 20 different things that have to be right. Mm-hmm. And each one of them is not necessarily a high probability situation. <laughs> each one of these 20. In other words, the odds of our being here, it's, uh, it's staggering. The odds against us being here mm -hmm. are staggering. Mm -hmm. We may very well be the only communicable civilization uh -huh. in our galaxy. Uh -huh. But <laughs> <laughs> there are hundreds of billions of galaxies even within our <laughs> visible universe. But they're so far away <laughs> that if we were to communicate with them, we'd send a message today, hello, <laughs> and it would be four and a half million years until we got a response saying, hi there. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> It'd be kind of hard to carry on a conversation that way. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Humility. Humility. Right? Yeah. yeah. 
humility and gift and grace in the midst of it all. And that's really, Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, paying attention is sort of the starting place in both theology and science. Mm -hmm. Paying attention. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether it's paying attention to my parishioners when I was a pastor, Mm -hmm. you know, hearing them say things, watching what they do, taking it in, noticing what's going on, or if you're sitting there in the lab and you've got, you know, two gigabytes of data you're trying to sort through. Pay attention to what's in front of you. And you can't do that if you're full of yourself. Mm. You can't do that if you're, th- if you're worried about yourself. You can't do that if you're concerned about your problems. I got plenty of problems. Mm-hmm. But I can't take steps forward with God or with science until I pre- just put it aside mm. and look at what's in front of you. Mm. In your, uh, in your other book, which, by the way, following this, we, we do have a couple of his, we have two of your books upstairs. Uh, one's called The Stars Beneath Us, Finding God in the Evolving Chaos. The other one's called Love and Quasars, An Astrophysicist Reconciles Faith and Science. They're both upstairs. Uh, you can pick one up uh, afterwards uh, in, the, in the Good News Cafe if you're interested. In Love and Quasars, you say the search for truth, be it scientific or spiritual, is never ending. Say a, a little bit more about how practically that applies to each of our lives uh, in, in, in individual ways as we also recognize that we live in a universe that's constantly expanding. You know, I'm a, I'm a journey guy, not a destination guy mm. on balance. I, I really think that it's the... That it's, it, it's the traveling forward is the journey itself and that's where the value is i do believe in finding answers i mean i'm a scientist i'm a physicist Mm -hmm. nothing makes me better nothing makes me feel better (laughs) than when i pound my head against the wall for a week and i finally solve a problem i've been thinking about and Mm -hmm. it's almost like a physical feeling in my brain i feel like a click in my head Mm -hmm. and it's a joyous moment or when i'm I'm a bird watcher i'm a birder when i go out and i see a bird and i don't I i can't identify it and then, I'm at, and then later on, either at the moment or later on, I'm able to identify. I'm, and it's just this super satisfying <laughs> click of discovery. Small scales, big scales, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And I'm not trying to discount that. But I do think that if you don't enjoy, and if you don't, what's the word I'm trying to say, accept and, and embrace, for lack of a better word, the trip, the journey, the uh, struggle, mm. because that's what it is. Mm. Whether it's your personal life, whether it's uh, religious life, whether it's scientific life, uh, if, you don't, if, if you can't make peace with the struggle and name it for what it is, then you're not gonna be able to experience that click, that, mm-hmm. that feeling of satisfaction. Mm-hmm. But that's not it. It's not like when that, when that key turns in your mind, it's not like, well, I'm done now. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to be thinking about any other, pro- any other situations. I'm done with all my struggling. And this is also true on interpersonal levels, right? right? F- within families or with whatever, you know, you, when you finally find a solution, which happens occasionally, even in families, um, you find a solution, you know, it, that's not the end of it. You have to accept a lifelong... Mm-hmm. Struggle might be too dark of a word, but a lifelong um, search. Mm. Search, that's a good word. That is a good word. That's what you have to accept. Yeah, yeah. And again, I hope uh, what everyone is hearing here is, is that uh, we know what we know. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. We know what we know. Uh, the church uh, has this profound ability in our everyday lives to mark time. Hmm. It's what we do. With our gathering together for worship on a weekly basis, that is a marking of time with God. As Episcopalians, we say uh, some of the same prayers over and over again through varying seasons of the life of the church to help us as humans living, again, in the words of the prayer book, on this fragile earth, our island home, 
that we are marking time in such a way so that we can make sense of what we know and to embrace uh, the mystery of what we do not know uh, in real time with one another. And so that through our words, our songs, our prayers, we can stay about the task of recognizing uh, that what we know is what we know and what we don't know, we don't know yet, right? But that our common life and our common prayer together uh, is worth marking and it's worth, uh, it's worth living into. And, and the reality of God is found in both what we know and what we don't know. Yeah. Exactly. It's not one or the other. It's not one or the other, right? Uh, and I think this is also what, uh, what's, so, uh, what's so beautiful about the fact that as we learn more, those of you who've heard us talk in our last series talking about the prayer book, we talked about the three-legged stool of uh, Richard Hooker's three-legged stool of the, uh, of the Episcopal faith, of uh, tradition and scripture and reason as these three parts of our tradition that we use to help us understand what it is that we know and to help us deal with the things that we learn as we make the journey of life together, right? Um, and so what I hope that you're hearing is that the invitation into mystery, the invitation to be curious, is always held. It's, it's not like we know these things, and because there's so much more that we don't know, we just need to kind of put what we know over here to the side. This is not about despair, right? <laughs> right. It's not about abandoning what we know. It's about appreciating the finiteness. It's about appreciating the basicness. It's about appreciating the faithfulness of what we know so that we can live our lives in community with each other. And then, I don't know if this is the right word, then we can be like wholly surprised. Mm -hmm. Like we can experience awe. Yeah. Awe is a lovely thing. Everybody in the room has experienced it at some point or the other. Mm. That, we can, that we can name awe when something happens in our lives or along life's journey that we just totally didn't expect. We, we, we all know the experience of when things don't go the way that we had hoped or prayed or planned. And hopefully on our journey, we also can pray about those moments where we experience awe and the expansion of our understanding of God's yeah. sort of intervention in our world. Because I hope it's a true statement. That is the nature of the universe. Yeah. Every, on every level. On every level. That God is not done working. And that we, as people in community with one another, have the ability to together experience and discover God working in new ways in our lives. Because that's, that's the nature of God and the nature of the universe in which we live, as we're coming to understand. Mm -hmm. All right, so what are, um, what are some spiritual practices that you think we as people of faith that can help ground us in this reality of, 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 of life with God? Well, um, I mentioned a moment ago that I'm a birder. Mm -hmm. um, I was a real, for like a few years as a child, I was big into birds, just kind of cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> I look back at like myself then, I'm like, boy, I was like <laughs> a little off the rails. Um, uh, but, and then when I turned like 13, <clears throat> I discovered Led Zeppelin and girls, and I just <laughs> forgot about birds. And then my dad picked it up. My dad picked up the birding thing. He got a pretty impressive life list, and he died in 2016. And within a year of that, I was out there birding again. Mm. And it has been, birding has been, without question, my number one spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it doesn't matter if I see any birds or not. Because mm. it's not about seeing, I mean, it, the birds are nice, don't get me wrong. That's why I go out there. But there are days when I go out, and it's just like, you know, a couple of sparrows and those cardinals. God, they're everywhere, you know. <laughs> Jeez, you know, would you shut up and let me hear, listen for somebody else. Um, but, but even on those days, you know what I end up doing? Mm -hmm. Staring at trees, paying attention. Mm. I'm focused on something. 
I'm, 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 it's essentially a, a practice, and, and I don't mean this in a negative way. I mean this in the most positive possible way. It's a practice of emptying my mind mm -hmm. and focusing and paying attention on what's around me. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's a subtle thing. Mm -hmm. Birding is a subtle thing. And I like to do it in solitude um, because that's when I can let my mind get into this state. But it is a, I believe that that kind of um, uh, self-forgetfulness, mm. I, I walk into the woods or I walk into the field and I can just feel my self-consciousness just go away. Mm. And that kind of, 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 of self-forgetfulness and that kind of paying attention is really, uh, Simone Weiss said something about this, said that that is, that is really the essence of prayer. Mm. And so I feel like when I have a, when I go birding, and I do it every chance I can get, mm -hmm. um, I, I always feel like when I, it doesn't solve my problems, but when I come back into my life, it just, I feel restored. Mm -hmm. And anything you do that helps you pay attention, mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't have to be birds. I mean, birds are obviously the best way to do it, but <laughs> but anything, whether you like yeah. to draw, whether you like yeah. to tend a garden, yeah, anything, you like to sing, yeah, you like to take walks. I, I don't yeah. care what it is, and, and and look around and notice things. Yeah. Anyway, anything you can do to help to help you pay attention to the world around you, that is the beginning, in my view. And this might not be something I can develop at this point, but that kind of paying attention is at the is at the root of both all good religion and all good science. Mm. It's the common cradle of the mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. mm. I think um, we live in an age of hurry and go <coughs> and anxiety and the invitation. Yeah. It is an invitation away from that. The invitation to recognize that all of that stuff, um, not, we're not going to go into Einstein again, but all of that stuff really speeds us up in space and time. And that the ability to develop spiritual practices in our lives that slow us down, that make us pause, mm -hmm. that make us get off the treadmill or whatever, uh, the Peloton, whatever your sort of uh, illustration is at this moment, and allow us to reconnect with uh, uh, both the vastness and the intimacy of God's mm -hmm. love in our yep. lives. That's a nice balance. Is, is just super critical mm -hmm. because, um, because all is gift and all is grace. Yeah. Um, it's hard to see that from inside the, the fray. It is. It's really hard to see that inside the, yeah. the anxiety of, of, of daily of daily life. Life, daily yeah. stress. Yeah, and we have to find those those practices. Um, this is not a commercial for the Skyview app, uh, but like birding, um, every once in a while I love to pull out the Skyview app as my own sort of way into that getting out of uh, the busyness of it and yeah. to pay attention. And um, uh, it's also interesting to watch the way in which uh, the cosmos around us lines up with our spiritual marking of time sometimes mm -hmm. in ways that are just absolutely beautiful. Y'all know we use the moon to decide when, uh, when Easter is, yeah. don't you? Do you all, or is everybody aware of that, right? Have you ever wondered why Easter hops around? It's because it has to do with full moons. It's okay? the first full moon. It's the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. After the vernal equinox, that is correct. So if you ever wondered, like, does our faith what do we really have to say about science? Well, a lot of our religious stuff is rooted in this deep appreciation for which we and cosmos together are constantly in conversation with one another um, as, uh, as those uh, on a real journey. Um, Paul, uh, I think you're going to come back and do some School of Faith stuff with us. I'd love to. And uh, I'm thankful for the conversation that we've had today. Uh, for the uh, for the in, for the calling us back to the intimacy of of life and of pausing, uh, and uh, I'm we're, we're glad that you're with us today. Thank so you very thank much. Thank you very much. Very for much being enjoyed here. it. Thanks thank for coming. Paul, for being here.